Jigar Shah heads the Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy, which has been a key part of President Joe Biden's policy to stimulate clean energy investment in the US. The Loan Programs Office has a budget of over $200 billion to lend, thanks to extra money from Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. The office aims to step in and provide debt to projects who would struggle to obtain that capital privately, providing a bridge to bankability. It aims to ensure that the clean energy supply chain is built in the US and not overseas, he told Benchmark's Giga USA conference this summer. The demand for these critical minerals are going to continue to go up, right? And I think when you look at the structure that we created out of OPEC, right, around, you know, the concentration of these types of market manipulations, um, we want to prevent that from happening in this supply chain, right? So I don't think it's an anti-one country point of view as much as a diversification policy that I think, as the senator suggested, is a bipartisan effort. In the critical mineral space, it has offered loans to lithium projects in Nevada, such as a conditional 2.26 billion loan to Lithium Americas for the construction of processing facilities at its Thacker Pass project, to graphite processing in Louisiana, and to recycling company Redwood Materials. Benchmark's chief operating officer, Andrew Miller, sat down with him for an interview at the Giga USA conference this summer to learn more. I really appreciate you making a bit of time to, to sit down with us and thank you again for being at the conference. Um, I wanted to start off, I was lucky enough to speak to you this time last year, I think, in one of our panel sessions. And um, I'm curious about, you know, what you see as the biggest milestones of your office over the past 12 months. And, and also, you know, whether the nature of some of the projects that are coming across your desk has changed given some of the changing market dynamics, for, especially for some of the raw materials. Um, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, you know, the, we're in the business of trust. Right. And so people have to spend a huge amount of time and then some money to be able to get through our office. Right. And so the question really is, is it worth it? Right. And I think that we have worked super hard to make sure that we explain ourselves. We you know, explain the rules. Uh, you know, we uh, have had some big announcements recently in the lithium space, but also the graphite space. And so as a result, I think that trust level has gone up. And so, you know, we have so many other conversations now with many people who said, well, you know, I could use that debt, but I just wasn't sure it was worth the effort. They're now all coming in, which I think is wonderful, right? And the goal for the Loan Programs Office is to use the resources we've been given to us by Congress to help make all this happen in the United States. So we really do uh, not have any preferences around, you know, this mineral over that mineral or this mine over that mine. I think our goal is to just make sure that we're onshoring and reshoring the supply chain. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the recurring themes we've heard over the past couple of days, and, and we heard from Senator Manchin this morning, is the, the issue of permitting. And I'm curious about when you're evaluating some of these projects, um, different parts of the country, what could be done to maybe speed up that process, do you think? And what, what needs to be done to sort of help push some of these projects forward? Well, as you know, some of it has already been done within you know, the budget negotiation deal where you know, the White House has provided up, get updated guidance on permitting and and so as a result, there's so many additional categorical exemptions and so many additional things that have happened on the NEPA side of things. Um, you know, I think that when you look at permitting for mining, right, I think we're operating under law from the 1800s. And so figuring out how to update that law to today is something that I think the secretary has talked very articulately about. So I think there is a desire for us to upgrade those things. But you know, I run a loan office, and so I have to live within the rule set that we have today. And the the lucky thing is, is that we have so many companies that even within the rule set that we have today are bringing their product to market. And so we're happy to support them. Fantastic. I'm curious a little bit about how you evaluate, like you say, with the, the wealth of companies now emerging, which is fantastic to see. I notice a lot here in North America are based around new technologies, trying to do things better or more efficiently and deploying, whether it be DLE in the lithium space, whether it be recycling technologies, looking to, to repurpose some of these materials. Um, I'm curious at how you evaluate that against the sort of short term need, because a lot of the rhetoric that we're hearing is about how do we do this quickly? How do we get this, you know, um, get these supply chains secured here in the US as quickly as possible? Um, I think that's slightly contradictory in a lot of cases to some of these new technologies just because they're going to take that that bit longer. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit to that maybe? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, the, uh, you know, we're private sector led, government enabled, right? So that, um, so the underlying premise of your question, I think, really comes from what Americans prefer, right? And I think a lot of American companies and American investors 
generally prefer a technology story. And so that's what they're seeing, right? Now, we are willing to fund debt into you know, projects that are more near term. We're willing to fund debt into projects that take a little longer to get to market. Um, I think we're willing to do whatever it takes to help you know, onshore and reshore here in this country, right? Obviously within the reasonable prospect of repayment that we have to meet. But I do think it, it is something that America likes to do. Like we don't like to just do things the same way everyone else is doing things. We like to use the researchers from the Department of Energy to try to kick it up a notch. And so, you know, like I don't know that I'm gonna apologize for the fact that everybody wants to make things a little more complicated and do a little more complex things. But I do think also this is a multi-decade uh, effort on our part, right? And so the goal here is not to win next week. I mean, the IRA just passed. And so I think the goal is to really diversify um, our supply chain by 2030. I think we're on track to doing that. And I also think that we have to recognize that there's just so much innovation in the battery chemistry space, right? And so right now we're expecting all of the electric vehicles to use this chemistry, but it could be a different chemistry in five years, right? Which is also super exciting for us at the Department of Energy. And so I think we continue to believe that technology is a key driver for America to differentiate itself um, from our you know, competitors around the world. See. Another, you know, thinking about that technology and some of the stories that you're seeing emerge and some of the companies you're already working with, but um, do you think there's part, when you look at this from a broader perspective, are there areas where you think maybe we're not seeing enough traction here in the US in that part of the supply chain, given the, the variety of technologies that are going to be required and need to be supported over time? I know some of them grab more of the, the headlines possibly yeah. at the moment and more of the attention. Are there parts that you're looking at what's in front of you and going, we're really not doing enough in this part of the supply chain? There are. Um, I'd say the loan programs office is not where that work happens. Um, so, you know, we have a manufacturing electricity supply chain office, and they are where we do a lot more of the grant funding. Um, and that's where they're really systematically looking at every one of, I think, eight dials around, you know, these materials and these materials and battery separators and whatever it is, and like saying, oh, we're short here. Let's make sure the next funding opportunity announcement actually focuses on these two or three areas where we're short. And so we're very excited about the partnership that we have across the Department of Energy to other offices that are doing that work. But really at the Loan Programs Office, you know, we can sort of chase deals per se, but ultimately if they don't exist in a form that's mature enough to receive, you know, our debt, then we sort of have to wait for them to mature. Absolutely. Sure. And I'm curious about one of the points that you raised to our delegation just a few minutes ago, and it was around the, I think maybe the people not quite appreciating the the, the real benefits of the long term approach that you can take versus maybe private private debt, which hasn't been as abundant. And I'm curious about, you know, do you think that will evolve over time? Are we going to see the private markets? Because I think we can all accept that we're going to need capital to be coming from lots of different sources to really make this all yeah. happen. Um, do you see that changing? And 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 you know, how long do you think that might take in terms of an evolution? Yeah, I think that's part of the trust building process, right? We talked about the trust building process with applicants, but we're also, you know, building trust with equity investors, right? Like part of what they're asking is, what did you evaluate in your debt, you know, financing? Like, what can we count on here when we provide equity to these folks? Why should we be so excited to them? And so we've had over 70 conversations with equity investors, not just in the critical mineral space, but across all of our sectors. Um, and we're starting to see a huge level of enthusiasm from them saying, oh, you guys really do a thorough job. Like, this isn't a waste of our time to spend more effort on folks who have conditional commitments. And so we're now going to prioritize those things over others. And I think that's great. And then the other piece of your question is around the tenor of our debt. You know, our tenor comes from the fact that we believe that the underlying asset is strong, right? So that if we get left with the asset because the equity, you know, doesn't execute well and we end up with the asset, then we can find someone else to come in and take over the project, right? That's why we're comfortable with providing a long tenor. And ultimately, when you think about a long tenor, it allows you to go through several business cycles. So when you look at the fact that, you know, today lithium is unnaturally cheap, um, you know, how much longer? Probably not that much longer. Like, it seems like a lot of the players can't make money at this price. So, and separately, we plan to 5x the amount of lithium that we need in electric vehicle space here in the next few years. So, you know, my sense is there's a lot more demand as well. So my sense is, is that, you know, if you think about a long enough term for debt, there may be some lean years, but over time you have a better 
sense of like where the prices are going to average. And so, you know, it makes it a better risk adjusted return for us. Sure. And maybe finally, just to wrap things up, I'm curious about the the, the nature of economics and you look across the supply chain, right? And, and I think, you know, one thing that gets thrown at US projects sometimes is that arguably they're not going to be at the lowest end of the cost curve in, in many of these markets. We're not going to find a new Salad Atacama anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, do you think we need more collaboration along the supply chain so that, you know, the, the automakers, the battery makers are actually, you know, um, stepping up, understanding the complexity of getting some of these projects up and running and, and really being able to, um, well, I suppose, how do you think we go about incentivizing some of these, you know, higher cross by today's standards projects, but really critical projects to emerge from a diversification standpoint? Um, how do you think we incentivize that across the supply chain? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of answers to your question. One is that um, we're early days, right? And so I feel like I think ex we everyone expects the whole thing about like how all of these new tools that we have are going to be fully implemented to be some sort of like static plan, but it's ever evolving, right? As we get more feedback from the private sector, we say, oh, maybe this tool should be used this way, not that way. Maybe we should add a new tool. So that work is happening. I think the second thing is, is that, you know, when you think about these uh, mines, right, the U.S. firmly believes, for better or for worse, that technology saves the day, right? And so we believe that even if we are at a slight disadvantage on the cost side today, that we won't be when the next generation of technology comes in, right? And we don't give that technology away for free anymore. We now like make sure that you know our um, domestic suppliers get first crack at that technology, much of which is continuing to be innovated at our national labs around the country, um, along with our you know folks in AI and others that are doing great work on the chemistry side. And then the last thing is, is that we are partnering with our allies around the world in terms of their feedstock um, uh, and capacity. But again, right, I mean, I mean, I don't know that much about diplomacy, but, you know, generally things don't get done like, you know, a week after you pass a bill. Like there's a lot of, you know, explanation that has to happen, like what part of the supply chain do you want to have in your country? What part of it do we want to have in our country? How does our automakers make their decisions around who they want to buy from? Because again, we're private sector led, government enabled. So they have to make decisions around who they want to partner with. And then we then, you know, come in and actually help create those relationships. And so there's a lot of work to be done and it's being done, but it's not completed. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that, you know, I think we are confidently moving forward. I feel more confident today than I did before that we are going to accomplish the president's goal of really diversifying the supply chain by 2030. That being said, um, there's a lot more work to do. And you know, I think that we're doing it. And I think every year when we come uh, to these conferences, we're gonna have a lot more detail around what we've accomplished and, you know, and how we're using the tools differently. Fantastic. Well, I think we all appreciate how much great work you and your team have done and what support you've been to the industry. So we're very excited to uh, see where things take us and, and what you come on to work with over the next uh, few months and years. So thank you very much for your time. Our pleasure. Thank you.